So my name is Heather Beam. Uh, my name is Nadine Bunkhard. And myself, I'm Aravind. I'm native from Sri Lanka. from 2010. My name is Elena Roska. My name is Catalina. If you were to summarize your message to the women in STEM, what could be that message? All in women sentence? should should follow their dreams and not be limited by the fact that they are women. Don't let labels or stereotypes hold you back. I wish everyone can be more confident in yourself and uh, brave the bright future. Be a role model. Be a role model for and, and pay it forward. So seek out good. Uh, I really think that the, the choice of your environment where you can be valued for who you are is extremely If there's important. something that's a passion of yours or an interest of yours, to pursue it to and begin. not to... I think we have to dream big and take risks and believe in yourself. Those are my three key things. And I think if you really internalize those three things, in my view, that will take you a very, very long way. The future is female, but the future is now, you know. <laughs> dream big, take risks and believe in yourself. I guess we can slowly start on this uh, session. And uh, so, firstly, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Namira, and I'm an After IGM Ambassador for Europe. Um, well, my team and I, we decided that it's great to, to have something like that in IGM. Uh, hello, um, we have one more panelist joining. And uh, um, yeah, basically, I would like to maybe start on with introducing our moderators, and maybe we can start on with Varsha or Sibel. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Varsha Jaisimha. I'm one of the ambassadors to Asia and I'm very excited to be part of this event. So, Sibel, Hi. maybe you'd go next. Hi everyone, my name is Sibel. Uh, I'm one, one of the ambassadors to Latin America. I'm here with you from Brazil. It's kind of early for you, but some of our panelists too. And thank you so much for joining our session. Hello, I'm Darcy. I'm the director of community engagement in IGEM Foundation and also one of the organizers for this global meetup. And I used to work on the STEM education program in China, so I'm so happy that I was invited to join this work. Okay, and so my name is Nanu Yijan, and I'm one of the ambassadors to Africa this year. So thank you once again to our panelists for joining in, and then thank you to all the attendees. So we'd like to get to know you if you could introduce yourselves in the chat. So I would start. So my name, like I said, my name is Nanui Jan. I put my country there and then the continent. So feel free to follow the same format. Also, you can add your team name if you want. And we have a Q&A section. So all your, your questions can go there. And one last thing is we'll be running um, some polls, so it would be amazing if you could answer them. And please feel free to use the Q and A section and the chat for all your your questions, and then anything else you want to be addressed. So over to you, Namira. Well, oh, so um, part on with the idea of this and why we decided to do this real quick. So basically, uh, the main idea is to inspire women in science and talk to people who can inspire all of us, or also people who are doing a lot towards improving the women representation in science. So today we will just talk uh, about this and also we will just, you know, uh, try to inspire you. And I hope you're gonna find maybe your role model in this chat and uh, hopefully um, we will be very important for your further career. And yeah, um, I guess we will start on with a um, panel, panelist introductions, and uh, on to you, Varsha, now. Thank you for the interruption, Amira. So what we could do is um, we're very happy to have such a diverse, inspiring panel from all around the world. And all of these are people who've been actively working towards creating a better future for women in STEM. So we could start off with your panelists and uh, with your introductions. Uh, do note to keep it between three to four minutes because unfortunately we are short on time as well. We have a time constraint. So we could start off 
with Dr. Elena Raska. Hello, everyone. My name is Elena Raska. I'm a bioengineer by training. I currently teach at uh, Ashesi University, and I'm also one of the mentors for the current IG, uh, IGEM team, and I supervised the team before in 2017. Um, currently, there's um, an Ashesi Ghana team um, participating in this year. Um, I have been involved and I've been quite passionate about um, STEM and particularly women in engineering and science and technology. I also have a degree in mathematics, so I've been quite around the, the only woman on the team for, for a while. Um, so I really um, like to be present and help um, women um, become more visible and more involved in the, in, in the STEM fields um, as much as possible. And I think that's it for me. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Dr. Oscar. Um, I think being the only woman in the team is a notion quite a few of us are quite familiar with. So um, thank you for that. Next, we'll move on to Dr. Catalina Lopez. Could you please introduce yourself? Yes, well, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Catalina Lopez Correa. I am uh, actually in Colombia. I am from Colombia, South America. I work uh, for a Canadian organization and I have been uh, yeah, working around different countries. My um, background is in medicine and genomics, so I have been doing uh, research in genomics in the last 20 years and advocating for women in science and women in STEM for a long, long time. Uh, we created, one of the things we created that has been super useful um, is what we call the Immigrant and International Woman in Science in Canada, IWS. And uh, you can, of course, uh, if you have some time, have a look at, at uh, what uh, our social media, IWS, we share a lot of information of the challenges immigrant women in science face when we're immigrating and moving to another country. And as we many, you know, in science, we move around the world and when we come to a new country, well, with all this, you know, challenges we face just by being woman and adding to that the fact that we are immigrant is, um, so is, is, is real bigger challenges. So yeah, that, that's, um, that has been, again, my passion and my work. And as many of you, I have been also in many, many occasions, the only woman in the room, the only woman uh, VP or vice president in, in, in several organizations. So it's like we, we are breaking barriers being the only one, but we have to start somewhere. Thank you for that, Dr. Catalina. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're very happy to have you here. And uh, knowing that you're someone who's dug really deep into actively working towards bringing women to the forefront, we, we do hope that you are, you're going to be one of the role models that all our participants take back with them from this session. All right. So next, we can move on to Dr. Heather Beam. Could you introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. My name is Heather. I am based in Ghana, West Africa. I'm actually a colleague of Dr. Elena Roska. I also teach engineering at Ashesi University um, as well. And in addition to that, I also started and lead a nonprofit organization that is seeking to promote hands-on STEM education um, across many schools in Ghana and then, um, other parts of the West African region. And so um, I love seeing more students get access to STEM. And I think there are a lot of stereotypes that prohibits, you know, females, especially in this context from going far in STEM. And I'm excited to, to try and challenge that, that status quo. Thank you. Um, hopefully, we could hear a lot more about your work in Penn later on into the discussion. Okay, for the next panelist would be our only man on the panelist, which would be um, Arvind Punch. So, would you love to introduce yourself? Thank you. Um, you can hear me, right? Yeah. So, 
Um, thank you. It's an honor to be in this uh, in this panel and to to tell more about the work that we have been doing. So myself, Aravind, uh, from Sri Lanka, I have an interdisciplinary background in art and, and science and engineering. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the last 17 years, I've been working on four domains, mainly in science, engineering, art, and sustainability. However, my core expertise is in, in research and development of electromechanical engineering and products, so to say. And uh, about to here, I'm here to, to represent Green Space Academy. It's one of my seven social enterprises that I have co-founded in three continents. And uh, at Dream Space Academy, we are empowering creative minds, especially from the underprivileged community, to, to tackle uh, socioeconomic and environmental challenges using project and challenge-based learning. And, uh, uh, and one of the... Uh, we work on different things. It's, it's, it's not only purely like science. We do like, you know, we teach uh, kids from anything from photography to biotechnology. You know, we have all different labs, storytelling lab, art lab, business modeling, business business lab, design thinking labs, and so on. And um, that's how we have a dedicated team for each of these vertical. And then we have a very good uh, team on the diversity and inclusion. So here I'm also to talk, so whatever today I'm gonna share is mostly about the, the combined experiences of our work as a social worker in the last 10 years um, with Sajani Balasingam from, from, and she's based in Sri Lanka. And also I have a lot of uh, uh, trainers. We have a lot of trainers in diversity and inclusion, Ola Hungaria, she's working in, in diversity and inclusion in Germany, New Zealand, Russia, and, uh, and Mali Baum. She's been uh, running a very women entrepreneurship uh, programs in Germany. So. Today I'm gonna to share all these combined experiences. I don't want to be just rather my my own uh, opinion, and uh, um, that during the the talk that it was recorded, that maybe we are a little bit uh, outlier than the other part of the world, because we have completely a different uh, uh, statistics, and it, it, we are a matriarchal society, so the numbers are completely different from other parts of the world. So I'm I'm here to give that perspective apart from your perspective, because we need to be, we are scientists, we need to be dialectic, we need to allow both discussion to happen, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're very glad that you bring in a whole new perspective to this discussion. One is from, say, a matriarchal society, where things have been different for a long time. And the second is, of course, from being uh, on the other end. So the, the others are, just, are women, we're bringing up by being role models themselves, whereas um, you bring in how men can contribute to bringing up women in STEM and creating an equal playing field. So thank you for your introduction there. And uh, now we can finally go on to Nadine Bongard, Dr. Nadine Bongard. Is she, oh, sorry, she's, she's not on the panel. <laughs> sorry. Um, great, so I would say that is the rest of our panelists. Thank you all for being here, and we hope to have a very fruitful discussion from this. So Namira and Sabel, could you please proceed with the Q&A session? Thank you so much, Varsha. Thank you, panelists, for being here. Uh, I'm seeing in the chat that we have people from all over the world, and our panelists are from all over the world. They were born in a region, they are living in another, and thank you so much again for being here. Well, I would just want to remind you to send your questions on the Q&A section. Uh, if you have a lot of questions, you can vote them and we will prioritize the ones you really want to listen to the answers. And well, I think Namira, we can start with a few of our questions. Uh, we had the amazing opportunity to interview all these panelists before today's discussion. So we were able to hear about their careers, hear about some of their experiences. And it was really interesting that one thing that was in common from all the panelists was the importance of role models, the importance of having mentors and someone that can inspire you. And well, I wanted to hear today that all our panelists are here uh, together. Like, how do you see um, that we can have more women involved in science in general and have them as role models. You being our role models here too. Anyone wants to start our discussion? <laughs> How can take <deep> volunteers? 
Okay, so I'll start with Catalina. Okay. <laughs> From Latin America too, so <laughs> go for it, please. <laughs> yeah, well, um, role models are, at least in my experience, they are a, a key part not only of our development, but also, you know, helping us understand, I would say, and, and, and unleash our own power. Because like, you know, sometimes I think like Wonder Woman, we have a secret power. We have all the secret powers inside ourselves, but sometimes it's difficult for us to, to show that we're able to, to, to even see ourselves that um, we have a path forward. So women that, um, with whom we can chat and with whom we can also see as a repair point and see, okay, if she got there, I can get there. And one of the um, things we're doing with IWS, this International um, an Immigrant Woman in Science in Canada, is that we, we don't think that um, mentors and role models are only people that are older than you that have more experience than you of course those are the most natural mentors because they already have a path and you can see you know maybe where you can get following their their example but we think that all of us even if we sometimes are maybe younger and we think oh we don't know that much but we all have experienced moments of discrimination or challenges as a woman or barriers as a woman and we have faced those so just by talking about those barriers and those challenges we can mentor each other even though we might you know we might all be we you know at the same level so it's good um, i think it's good to have mentors that are maybe older and with more experience so mothers that are uh, the same age and almost the same experience and that's what I try to do also myself. I have some women that are, you know, super powerful, super important that I try to use, you know, have contact with them and have them as mentors. Some others are same, same as me, you know, my same level of, of job and experience and also younger people and younger women and, and men too. I think it's important to have mentors and sponsors that are men and that also understand our challenges and open paths uh, for us. So mentoring, I think, and some organizations, I remember when I worked for Eli Lilly in a pharmaceutical company in the U.S., they had it as a mandatory um, uh, thing. That you have to have a mentor inside the organization, mostly to help you walk the organization, not just to help you in your career, but understand how the organization functions. They started that way, but ended up being a really useful um, model system for everybody to have these mentors and build these relationships so it's very i think it's one of the most important things in your career to find a mentor that's great and um, as i i told that on all the recordings and for some of the panelists i didn't had the chance to meet on the recordings you're already our role models you can know that for sure and thank you again so much and well talking about role models and moderators we also think about educators and here we have two incredible professors uh dr Oscar and dr bean and i want to hear your opinion too on that as educators what can we do and how we can inspire the next generation this generation of women science sure i think i'll take this one and then i'll pass the baton to to heather um so I absolutely agree um, that we need to create even more than just one particular mentor. I think we need to create a network that supports women and, and girls to to um, be involved, more involved in the in in the STEM um, environment or or space. And I think as educators, or for for me as an educator, has been a lot more not necessarily to push or attract, but more more over to um, to be available and to be one of those supports for, um, for girls, for instance, in engineers, in engineering um, field or in science field. 
um, to be there and to have my door open all the time and be able to to talk to them about not just about being a woman in a in an engineering field, but anything else that they might want to talk about. So just being in that space and have a a, a door open um, and being willing to listen sometimes more than just giving them an advice, but just being able to listen to their struggles and then and then maybe point them into some of these connecting um, pieces in this big network that you, that you can do and. And I guess that, in some sense, that is the the um, the definition of being a mentor or a role model. Um, but I think that, for me particularly, that has been um, more the most important thing. And then for myself, as to continue on to grow in, within that network. So um, uh, one of the things that um, I, I've been able to to do and connect was with um, Heather's um, a program, which is really amazing. And especially in Africa, it's a really amazing program. So I think I'm just gonna, with that, I'm gonna pass on the baton to, to Heather to tell you about her experience and her program. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, um, I think that there are, there's a lot that we can do as educators, just as Dr. Roska shared. I also think that there are some systemic things that we can seek to influence. So for example, um, a lot of students here as they go through school, it's possible that the only picture of a scientist that they've seen is a white male, you know, in a lab coat. And so there are things that we can do, changing um, imagery, you know, in textbooks and creating more materials that create a more representative picture of, of what people look like out there in the world. So I think that there are some systemic things we can we can seek to influence. Um, and then I think as educators, it's also helpful to check our unconscious biases. Um, I think that, uh, so for, for Penn, we did a small research study and uh, it, it, it looks like there, for, for some of the teachers that participated in our research um, study in which we were supporting them to deploy frequent use of hands-on STEM activities in their teaching. It looks like there was, you know, some unconscious bias to engaging the boy, the male students more than the female students. And so I think there's also some things that we as educators can do ourselves and also, you know, seek to um, point out in our colleagues in a, you know, in a non-threatening way, but to, to try and um, address some of these more ingrained things that exist. Definitely. Um, and well, talking a little bit about system, uh, systematic changes, I want to hear a, a little bit about uh, from Arvind. Uh, he told us a, a bit about the educational system in Sri Lanka and how things are different there. Could you share with us a little bit about that, please? Yeah, uh, thank you, Sibyl. I just want to have a segue to what uh, Heather mentioned. Uh, so we are really missing that uh, image uh, of like, you know, having uh, women scientists in lab code being like, you know, geeky and nerdy. And that's, that's uh, as a, as a and, and, and if you look at those countries, like, you know, on the Indian subcontinent, we are very much culturally driven, driven by cinema, but the cinema is showing a very wrong image of like, you know, glamorous and, and so on. This is one of the point that, one, you know, when we discussed with my team, they were saying, you know, we need to have more, you know, uh, women-centered stories than, than, you know, just showing, uh, you know, a wrong picture. Um, yeah, so about like um, uh, the question about Sri Lanka in general. So somehow, um, 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 I don't know how many of you know that we had 30 years of, of, um, uh, of war um, involved in several, you know, genocidal, I would say, in some ways. And, uh, uh, and it was a civil war, maybe like in this way. And the 30 years of uh, war influenced a lot of things. And somehow the society that, that I'm talking about, very specific to Sri Lankan Tamil society that, that has this matriarchal uh, uh, system there, maybe that influenced also this. So according to the latest numbers that I've been like, you know, taking all the statistical number from the, the, the governmental statistics that I, I see in every faculty, that is a huge, like, uh, like if I look, I, I can say that, you know, the postgraduate graduations, I look at like, you know, 60% women in science and 52% in, in medicine and 66% in, in dental science. And I see like 
67 person in computer science and in total like you know 45 in all the faculty male and then like 50 point 50 uh, uh, in uh, in uh, 55 in in women and if you look at even the the graduate output that they have like in the performance wise if you took a they, they have a combined statistic of of all the faculty female they have 64 percent and then uh, male has 36 percent and this is probably again maybe it's a cultural matriarchal thing because what we mentioned in our call is that uh, we have the cultural barrier even though we are like so different from the nearby country we have still have the cultural barrier that girls they have to get married at a certain age so when there is this deadline they are pushing a lot because they see that this is a deadline we have to do it faster and we have to do it better and uh, the good news about that in, in when comparing to the nearby country uh, in the indian subcontinent that they enter this family life, uh, they have the family, but after 40 years old, there is a strong comeback happening because of maybe this is an advantage of the matriarchal society that, you know, kids are like the women is staying with mother. Unlike the other country, that when women get married, they go to the boy's house. In our society, boys come to the girl's house. And, and, and maybe because of that, you know, the family is able to take care of the kids and support them. And, and when they are 40 years old, they are able to go back and push it further. And this is one of the, uh, the probably one of the reason that we are a little bit different. And I also like, you know, proudly say that Sri Lanka has the first uh, uh, female president in the world. Uh, that was, uh, she's Bandar Naika, she's from uh, Sri Lanka. So even though, Whatever I say, we have still an imbalance in our community work that we do because all these influence, all this engagement of women are in the institutionalized uh, in the institutions and organizations like, you know, institutional certified organizations. But when it comes to community and social work, even being a community scientist, we don't have a community engagement or community, however you call like a STEM, uh, we don't have that much. Uh, that is the struggle that we are trying to push, um, like the struggle that we are trying to solve here by just involving. But generally, whether a boy or a girl, generally there is a, a, from the institutional scientists, they don't believe on the community scientists because they think that, okay, you are, you are trying to do biotechnology in your small lab and you are institutional. And this was a struggle that we are globally fighting to, to prove ourselves that being in a community also you can make a great uh, contribution to STEM or STEAM, STEM, whatever. So that is my uh, perspective. And uh, if you have any further question, I'm happy to answer. So to continue maybe on this whole topic, maybe you can shortly uh, very people can find these role models. And did you have a role model when you were in the beginning of career, in your career, or maybe you still have a role model, what you want to achieve, even you know, at this stage of your career? So basically it's a question for all the panelists here. And um, yeah. Who yeah, was... I, I, I can maybe start. And also I would like to, before answering uh, the question, Namira, um, I would like to add a little bit on, on, on what we were saying about the numbers and, and even one of your questions here, one of the survey that's appearing on the screen on uh, uh, the number, uh, the percentage of women in your organization. That's one of the questions we have to answer here on the screen. And this is a, a question in particular that has always, I, I have always have interesting discussions about this question, because if we look at my organization, even the one I was working here in Colombia, which is an innovation hub called Ruta N in Medellin, in Colombia, when I came, they were all very proud and say, oh, you know, we are about 60% women. And I say, well, this percentage doesn't mean anything, actually, because, yeah, we're 60% women, but the director is a man. The, all the, the president is a man. The directors are men. The board of directors is all men. And, yeah, of course, all the rest below is women. But the, who, who is the making the decisions in the company? Who is making all those is the men? So those... Um, 
you know, as Harry was saying, these are also very cultural things that are anchored in our society and, and all this unconscious bias that we are. And sometimes, you know, we talk about the unconscious bias, we talk about the glass ceiling, we talk about the imposter syndrome, all these little names that sometimes sound funny and all that. But when you start to read about those, they are real. So, well, so I think it's important to, to, to get those concepts also and read a little bit about that and understand where we're coming from. Now, in terms of the role models, you know, I think there are all kinds of role models. I, you know, for me, um, I, I go from even, you know, the extreme Michelle Obama. I have never met Michelle Obama, but I read her book and it's so inspiring. And I learned so much from, you know, the way she's doing things and, and how she approach in her life. So I get inspired by just, you know, reading books and looking at people that are sometimes either celebrities or important people like Michelle Obama. And also, you know, colleagues, as I say, in, in every one of my jobs, I, I, I sometimes even I am upfront and ask, um, uh, can, can you be my mentor? Can I ask you to be my mentor? And I will say maybe 80% of the time it has worked. But I also have faced people that have said, oh, sorry, maybe I'm too busy and I don't have the time. Or they maybe say, yeah, 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 yeah. And at the end, no, 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 no. So, but you have to take the risk, you know, take the risk to go and ask the people, okay, you know, I, I, I think I can learn a lot from you. I would love to have a chat. And I have done it with, as I say, with men and women. And I've learned a lot from both. Um, because of course, men, men they will have different perspective of the role women have in in in, in science, and and I think is is we cannot just um, stay close and woman talking with woman. That uh, again, out of it, having you here and speaking, uh, you know, about the challenges women are facing uh, is also very very important because it has to be also, you know, it has to be a societal change. It's not just women. Of course, we, we have to change, but it's the society that, that needs to change. And having also um, younger people, you know, lots of people contact me and, um, you know, my partner always laughs and say, you never say no. You're super busy, super busy, super busy, and you never say no. Well, I never say no. You know, even if it's a little bit of time and even if it's, you know, just a chat, uh, just a coffee, I always try to give the time to chat and to listen and to, um, when, when it's needed, give advice or learn from others. So, yeah. yeah Thank you very much, Carolina, for, for, for that. Um, that was great. And, and I think I would, I would definitely um, agree with everything you said. And, and I, one of the things that on a personal level, I always felt that, you know, being part of the women in, you know, in engineering or science, um, that um, it, it's good, but then it's also kind of not the best thing is that you want to say, you know, you want to have men involved in that, in that environment. And especially as you pointed out that most of those, um, uh, mo most of the important position or the decision-making positions are held by, by men. And so not understanding or not bringing them into, into this environment and into, into the space, I don't, th I don't think that it solves the problem. So I think that's probably one of the most things that we, we have to do actively is where it isn't women versus men, but it's rather a community, for instance, of scientists that come together and figure out what are the obstacles that um, uh, women see or men see for that matter, because I, I'm sure they, they probably have some others as well on, on their side and, and we should probably be um, cognizant of that as well. Um, and, and then to follow up with you, I think the, the role model or the models are all the people around you, not just, you know, there's, there's definitely um, inspirational models, I would say. I was just listening this morning to the speech that um, Kamala Harris gave this morning for the acceptance of yesterday, for acceptance of her vice president. And it was just so amazingly inspiring. Um, uh, it made me wanting to go vote right now. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think it, it, these, these people, um, the, these women that make it to these positions and give these amazing speeches that can really rally um, 
all the people around him, not just women and girls, but all of them around them, to really your, you know, your mother, your friend, um, your colleague, who you had a coffee or a muffin in the morning, and you talked about, you know, things of, of that bothered you the night before or the day before, or things that, you know, the next grant that you have to write and you can't find a collaborator in this particular um, field and things like that. So I think it's, it's more of a network than rather to say, I have one role model. I have one person that I'm looking up to, um, to, to help me and support me getting whatever it is that I, that I want. Can I? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Go yeah, ahead. yeah. Th th yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Catalina and um, uh, Elena for the the perfect segue. So as 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 to answer uh, to Catalina, also like that's very true. If you really look at the 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 executive power and decision making in big corporations, even if you have a like, and you know, I worked in a corporate where there were like seven hundred thousand employees and four hundred thousand engineers there was a time and they had like 40% of women in the company. But when you look at the executive power, that's completely different. This was actually in India, not in Sri Lanka. And um, in Sri Lanka, uh, why maybe is again war probably because we never have uh, men in our society because the, when the war started, they initially men were targeted. So I, I, I never, my, my, I saw my father in a few times in my life. And it was the same for every family that the, the kid was only like the father is away or killed or like you know, ran away to another country and, uh, and then only mother. So, and then when this question was, I really wanted, I had this feeling that I have always seen in this family, mother was the decision maker. And then I asked my community, and is it true? And then everyone said, yes, even if there is a discussion from the father, even now, even though there's no war and mother is the, is the decision maker. But when it comes to maybe change after the war and then like, you know, still you see a lot of executive power, male is sitting there in, in the politics and so on. And uh, that is something uh, maybe we should uh, positively bring back to our world condition that mother is still there, the decision maker at home. And I have, I have discussed this with my uh, the expert, the, Mali, she's running a women empowerment program for, for you know, in Germany and Israel for long. And then, Exactly what you mentioned about role models, they don't have to be some su super celebrity. You know, they can be your friends, your colleagues, your network. So when I asked Sajani, like, how do you really keep intact? Like, how do you keep this team of girls that, you know, they have to be empowered and supported? She told that rather than being in a hierarchy, okay, I'm your mentor, you are my mentee, rather just be a good friend to them to talk about many things very deeply. So one of the problem still in our society that parents wouldn't allow girls to go on, on an excursion with boys because they might think that, you know, they will fall in love and, and, you know, all these issues. So Sajani and her team is actually talking openly and deeply with her team, these girls, about the love and the sex and, and all very young people, right, you know, 16, 17 years old. And that is what is for us, we see as a role model, like, you know, someone who already empowered, is empowering another girl or women than like, you know, showing someone who is really sitting somewhere far away, like, you know, Michelle Obama and or like, you know, Hamla Harris or, so we need to have those role models very close to us uh, who can mentor them and, uh, you know, support them. And this is my, this is how we are doing it. And I hope uh, this, is, this is what the other organizations around the world are also doing. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so moving on the questions, we have a really interesting one that is, how did you set your mindset to achieve so much? And well, on the recordings, one thing I said, I told you, Catalina, is that she gave me a new mindset. So if you could share with us a bit, a little bit of our, our your five mindsets, please. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the secret ingredients. <laughs> I, I will give you the secret ingredients. No, it's, it, it, you know, it, those are things that have worked for me, might not work for everybody. But um, I think that the first thing that I will say is uh, dream big. I think it's important to allow yourself to dream and think that you're able to do it, that you, you can have big dreams. And it's not just... Um, 
you know, so people say, oh, you know, I, 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 when I was a child, I was dreaming about being an astronaut, but it's impossible because in my country, well, if you really want to be an astronaut, dream big, dream about, you know, don't, don't, don't be shy about your dreams. So dream big is, is number one. I think the second one for me is, is to, to just get, the, get an education, get the right education, get uh, you know, the path and education that will help you follow that dream. That for me has been uh, a very, uh, you know, very important uh, part. The third, I would say, is uh, get, um, you know, uh, as we are saying, a, a model, uh, get a mentor, get somebody and many as we, we are saying, it's not just one mentor and that mentor will help you. In every step of your life, when you're standing, you can have a few mentors, few models. When you are advancing in your career, you can have another one. So get this mentor and models. Second, uh, the fourth, I would say, is uh, just don't give up. You know, we face many, many persevere and don't give up because we, we all have difficulties. When people ask me to tell about my career and I look backward and say, oh, I did this, 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 it sounds so easy. Sometimes it sounds like, oh yeah, you know, and then I finished my PhD. Well, but finishing my PhD was already, you know, such a difficult thing for me. And I had to, uh, I start one and I had to change lab laboratories and I had to change uh, my director. Anyway, so every step you have challenges and it's important to persist, persevere and, and don't give up. Don't give up. And um, the, the, the last one that I think is the most important one is believe in yourself. Believe in you. You can, as Obama always said, yes, we can. But in this case, it's yes, I can. So if I would like to summarize maybe in three of those five, I would say dream big and also take risks because that's also in, 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 in the same thing as persevering. It's like, you know, you have to sometimes to take risks and persevere in, in the things you're doing and believe in yourself. So those are my, I would say, the, the way I see that... Um, we all face difficulties. We, nobody has a path that is already made for them. We all face challenges and barriers, but if we don't start by this dreaming, if we don't take those risks and, and persevere and work hard, and if we don't believe in ourselves, it's, it's more difficult to achieve those goals. So, That'll be the next question I want to, it's also from the Q&A and we are kind of running short of time. So I was thinking maybe we can um, talk a bit more about shortcomings of how STEM is currently being taught and uh, maybe uh, have a bit of uh, practical education network. Maybe we can comment on that a bit more because obviously that's pretty related to the STEM and in general accessibility. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I agree that the role models are an important piece of helping uh, women like us thrive in STEM. But I think that another really important piece is what STEM education actually looks like. What, what are females experiencing as they go through school? Um, here in, in Ghana, there's, there's actually a phrase that people use. It's called chew and pour pass and forgets. And the idea is that students feel like they're chewing information. They're just memorizing things and then spitting it or pouring it out on the exams. So there's this like very ingrained feeling that as you go through school, as you go through science or whatever, you know, it's not really re meaningful. It's not relevant or meaningful. You're just memorizing things to try to get through. And um, the work that Practical Education Network is seeking to do is to change that status quo to enable schools in every corner of the country to have very practical hands-on activities going on regularly. And we do this by leveraging low-cost, locally available resources, and then we help teachers um, practice how they can use those things um, in, their, in their teaching. And so what we see when we do this, as you can imagine, is that when there are you know, real tangible things for students to engage with, the interest really shoots up. And especially if it's tied to local issues, um, local resources, if, if, the, 
if there's a connection between whatever shows up on the textbook pages and then what you're physically seeing, and you can see how that concept of acids and bases or whatever reflects in the food that you eat, then suddenly the, the subject becomes much more real and interesting. And we've also seen that this disproportionately affects females in a positive way. So when um, in the studies that we've done, when female students here in Ghana are engaged in these activities, their interest goes up even more than their male counterparts. And so there's a lot we can do to make what students are actually experiencing real and meaningful for them. And I think that that plays a major role in, in getting females um, to pursue STEM in the long term. Can I go? Just, yeah. Uh, yeah. So from our side, uh, the, the, the only strategy that works for us, if we want to, if we, when we are empowering young girls, the first step we do is we empower their parents. That's it. It doesn't work other way around for us. So we just go to the parent. We just let them know that you know she's uh, the the her, their daughter is is very uh, you know intelligent and she's like doing great things. And then the parent should not pamper too much and worry about like the failure. And then we let the parents do their daughter whatever her, she wants to do. So the empowerment of uh, girls and women in our society we do it by empowering the parents. And I don't know would that be the same situation in other parts of the world, but this works uh, very well for us. Um, thank you. We also uh, have a question. Um, oh, hello. We have one more panelist uh, joining us now. So uh, hello, Nadine. And uh, yeah, so we probably will continue again with a, one more question from the uh, Q&A because it seems like people are really engaging very well. Thank you very much. And uh, so basically another question would be that did you feel at any time that being a woman, you needed to prove yourself again and again? And, um, and also uh, there were some comments as well that some of our of people who came to listen attendees be based things like that so maybe you can share if you had that or not and maybe it depends on the region so I'm gonna start on first on this all right <laughs> well um, so basically um, maybe um, maybe somebody can answer this question typing maybe because it Obviously, we are running out of time now, and uh, um, Namira, we lost you when you were saying, "What question are you talking about here?" So we lost. I'm so sorry, um, Sibel. Maybe you want to take over. Sure. Hey, just a second here. Uh, so, the question is: If at any time did you feel uh, that being a woman, that as being a woman, you needed to prove yourself again and again? Uh, in technology or as a science expert, as opposed to your male counterpart? If yes, how did you overcome that? Yeah, maybe, maybe I can quickly start. And I, I always say, even to my colleagues and, uh, you know, to people and, and that I meet in different forums, that I, I feel that I always, uh, you know, normally you start a new job uh, and I have work in, you know, 10 different cities, seven different countries, uh, I don't know, all, all these different companies. And it's not that my company is changing me, it's I change different companies in every country. But I always feel, you know, you normally in, you should, you start a job from zero. People don't know you, you don't know the people, and then you have the qualifications, you pass the interview, you start from zero. But I always feel that I start from, not from zero, that my white male colleagues start from zero, but I start from basically minus 20 or sometimes minus 30 because I, I, I always feel that I have to prove myself more. Oh, she's Latino. Oh, she has an accent. Oh, she's gay. Oh, she's all these minority things. And people think, okay, or at least, you know, I see that I always have to prove myself. I always have to maybe feel that I have to work harder. I have to put more hours. I have to show I'm intelligent. I have to show I have the qualifications. I have to show I, have, I, I am able to do the job. 
So I'm hoping and I'm dreaming that there is a point where, where you know, because you have the qualifications, you pass the interview, you, you can, you know, you're able to do the job. But yeah, but you know, it's sad to say, but the answer for me is yes. I, 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 I often feel that I have to start from, you know, really, as I say, minus 20 to prove, my, to prove to others that I can do the job. But I have been able to do it, and I think you can do it too. <laughs> yeah, if I can maybe, um, sorry for joining in so late. By the way, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm here based in Paris. My name is Nadine. I work at a, as a senior scientist at a startup Gourmet, uh, where we work on uh, making um, uh, cell-based uh, foie gras. Um, ah. very, very French product that we try to make in a more ethical and sustainable way. Uh, and I can very much relate to what Catalina said. I, I think I also had that sort of inner push all the time that you feel like you have to you sh yeah, prove, prove yourself. But I'm not always sure if it's maybe th that I want to prove myself of, to myself, basically, or, or to others necessarily. And in a way, just on a positive side, I think if you want to, if, if you are very ambitious and you want to push yourself, um, can also really, yeah, sometimes it can also help you to do things that you may not expect that you can actually uh, do the things that um, maybe you thought were impossible. So I do see um, um, maybe also a positive uh, side of, of, of that, uh, of, uh, yeah, of this need to, to always prove yourself. It can be stressful, that's for sure. And uh, sometimes, um, uh, especially if uh, uh, it, it would be, yeah. I um, but I, yeah, I also see a positive side of things. And maybe if people underestimate you in the beginning, but you show, you prove them wrong, it can also be very satisfying, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Um, if you work hard and you know what you can do, then you know if people underestimate you in the beginning, it's not necessarily bad because you have a great opportunity to show them what you're really capable of. Thank you, Nadine, I, I, and thank can, can you. Oh, can I say go something ahead, quickly? So, so again, exactly. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm coaching a, a, a friend of mine. She's from a microbiologist from Cameroon. And throughout her life, she told recently that uh, she's, she said that she's small. I mean, I know her personally. That because looking small, she always had a feeling that people are bullying her and like, you know, this. And she was always, you know, feel, felt bad about it. And then she started working as a nurse. And all of a sudden, her being small was like she became, like every patient is asking, where is our small angel, you know, like in the hospital. The same thing that was negative for her has, has become positive. And she said that she could break out of that feeling and thought and push more and then, you know, change internally and externally. And, and that's why, as, as Nadine said that, you know, we might have challenges, all of us. So we need to, to, to push ourselves to, 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 you know, to prove ourselves maybe initially and then then the world is uh, you know i mean world is all ours right yeah yeah thank you um thank you nadine for joining us in the last minute but we're happy that you were able to introduce yourself and answer one of the questions there um thank you to all our other panelists for being part of the discussion we're unfortunately we're pressed for time i'm sure everybody would love to extend this discussion way further um, we have hopefully answered all the questions in the Q&A except for one, which we will not be able to take up with the lack of time. We apologize. Uh, so Nemaya, would you like to conclude the session? Yeah, well, I would definitely want to like thank everyone. And obviously, if somebody can answer that last question, uh, just go ahead. I think it's a very interesting question as well there. And um, well, I would just really would like to maybe ask you for the, maybe you have some final thoughts you, the panelists would like to share uh, before we, I wrap everything up. <laughs> if I may, um, one thing that um, I think struck me in, in the last question was that I think we all agree that we have um, 
challenges and we are inevitably going to encounter challenges in the near future and probably long future. Um, but I think the, um, what, what I personally looked at it is that can we find a silver lining in that? And so proving yourself over and over and over, you become very persistent and very good at doing that and very efficient at doing that. So I think if we look from, you know, trying to turn some of these challenges in some and, and find a silver lining in them and how they can help us grow and how we can use them to help others grow and, 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 become, uh, and, and become better. I think, I think that's, that's quite, uh, quite important in my, in my opinion. Yeah, maybe um, on my side, uh, I, will, I will finish by, you know, repeating my three mantras, you know, dream big, take a risk and, and, and believe in yourself. But I also will add one more thing that is important uh, and that is uh, just to support each other. And this concept of sorority or working with, with sometimes we are harder as a woman with other women than we are with, we you know, with men or others. So I think it's important to support each other. And that's why we have created this International Woman uh, in Science and Immigrant Woman in Science Network. And that's to support each other, to open uh, and help open doors between us. And actually men have been doing that for ages. You know, they support each other. They give, uh, they help uh, to getting opportunities. They pass, oh, I know my friend, uh, look, he sees CV, well, why not doing that with your woman friend and say, okay, look at her CV, she's your candidate, she's the person, or so support each other. I think that's very important. And spaces like these one here, this panel, help us build these networks where we can support each other. So that support, I think, is also very important. Anyone else final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of uh, very good stuff has already been said, but um, uh, to, to maybe complement it a little bit, uh, I think trying to look for an environment where you can be valued for who you are and where people want you to grow um, is, is very useful. So already early in your, in your career, whether it's an internship, a PhD or, or a job, if uh, people accept you for who you are and see your potential, then, uh, then that can really help you also to feel confident and maybe feel less need to prove yourself over and over again because you know that you're around, surrounded by people who, who see what you're capable of. And I think that can create some more inner peace um, and, and a, lot of, uh, um, yeah, a lot of help for yourself to, uh, to learn as much as you can and, um, and grow in your career. Okay, I'll also say that I'm sure that everyone on this on this call is, um, you know, already quite interested and in, into STEM. And so I would just say that keep using that interest, keep using that passion, that intrigue that you feel for, for this field to drive you. And there will be challenges along the way, but um, I think, you know, keep reminding yourself that that if, if you're interested in this thing, then you can succeed in it. Nothing, nothing can stop you if, if you're interested. Keep letting that drive you. Um, Arvind, do you have any last thoughts? Yeah, so I, as I said before, just don't, uh, don't be scared of failures. You know, just go on. Like, you know, don't think the society is going to accept failures of boys, but not the girls. Just you know, do it, you know, don't worry about it. And the second thing that my team, diversity and inclusion experts, they said, uh, empowered women should empower other women. And this is very important. And uh, please keep doing it. As, uh, uh, as Catalina was saying, the boys club are, is known and we need to have that girls club, you know, really like true, true connection. The same with the boys club work. Uh, not having some kind of a jealousy and here and there and you know just empower them truly and this is this is suggestion from my community my experts uh, and from my side thank you well to to wrap everything up i would like to thank you again for joining us sorry we went a bit over time i hope it doesn't clash with your schedules and uh 
I just really want no, to thank again and again for obviously supporting this initiative, obviously for the panelists who definitely helped us out a lot and also for the team. Uh, we all worked a lot to, to, make, to, to make this real and uh, thank you everyone for joining this as attendees, as panelists or as moderators. And um, you can always get in contact with me or any of the ambassadors or um, probably any of the panelists maybe as well, if you have any questions to them. Um, so yeah. Uh, I, I hope we all uh, get, got inspired now. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, it's tough. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, also, one really important thing, as we mentioned on the beginning, we, inter we were able to interview these amazing panelists individually. So they answer a lot of our questions and we'll be releasing those recordings one each week as our Women's Day campaign. Uh, and well, please share these videos, follow these amazing panelists. And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all for joining us very much. <laughs> and hopefully we will see you again in other future events that do continue to inspire us. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for your uh, organizing very much again. Thank and uh, have a good day, evening, morning. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>